Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, coming. My name is uh, Joseph and uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to uh, moderate this uh, panel. Uh, Deborah and uh, Vincenzo gave me this uh, uh, role today, uh, which I'm very honored uh, because we were just saying that I remember clearly the first time I met uh, Deborah here at uh, Warner Space. Uh, she showed me the works of uh, Nene and they literally captured my attention and we said, okay, let's follow up, let's meet at the Knickerbockers uh, <laughs> in Times Square. You know, uh, in 30 minutes we go over uh, and see if we, we can work together. Uh, we spent almost three hours. <laughs> they almost kicked us uh, out from the, from the venue, but uh, it, th there is so much uh, to say about this extraordinary uh, artist and today we have the chance, the unique chance to hear directly from, from the son uh, Vincenzo and the granddaughter Deborah about the experience of, of a really I mean, um, a powerful example of, uh, of a strong woman who was able uh, to really ho hover over a, a century and uh, uh, a very long uh, articulated uh, complicated uh, century where we had two major world conflicts the world uh, completely uh, changed and if you if we just think about in the, in the 50s and the 60s the contract position between the communist bloc and the western bloc sounds like another 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 planet like another uh, another dimension and that was history uh, 50 years ago and um, so uh, because we have the chance of this uh, incredible uh, testimony uh, today and uh, we have such a large uh, span of time to, uh, to cover, uh, we thought that the simplest way uh, today we have the chance to get to know Nene a little bit better and uh, appreciate the, her talent embodied in her works and uh, this uh, retrospective uh, not only personally for Vincenzo and Deborah is a milestone is a turning point in terms of all these efforts, all these years, uh, in order to uh, protect this uh, legacy and bridge it to the next generation. And it is important because uh, just looking at these uh, works, uh, we can appreciate the, the, the complexity and the intimacy, the deepness of these works. And they actually look, it looks like an exhibition of at least three, four different artists. <laughs> Instead, it's, it's one person, it's the path, the evolution of, of one person that besides being an artist, was a mother, was a wife, uh, a grandmother, a, a traveler. And uh, it's uh, truly interesting to uh, dig a little bit uh, deeper, uh, trying to understand uh, what was going on in, inside. Uh, the brain and the heart of this uh, woman for, for so many years. If we think that she was born in a time where still we had uh, horses and candles and, and she ended up in the internet era, well, maybe if we picture that, <laughs> uh, we, we might start to better understand uh, also what is the personal journey of a person that is, was born in one era and, and then when she left us, uh, the world uh, already completely changed. So. Um, definitely I would uh, uh, start with Vincenzo uh, uh, because he can uh, um, like give us some insights considering these three major periods. So we're gonna go, we're gonna follow the, the same journey, we're gonna try to follow the same journey that uh, Nene uh, experienced starting from a first uh, period that is most, uh, mostly figurative uh, and uh, it's the time that uh, is before uh, moving to uh, Africa, where she, where she spent 30 years with, with, with the family. And then after these 30 years in, in Africa, extremely dense and intense, she goes back to Italy and uh, she experiences uh, another stage of her life and her artistic uh, career. But we're going to go over these three different segments uh, separately. So the first um, of course, the first question would be in uh, considering the, the early years and her first uh, contact with, with art um, from the direct voice of uh, Vincenzo, uh, what, what he witnessed, what was he as a young boy, uh, what was his perception of his uh, mother having this urgency to express her talent uh, through, through art? 
<coughs> it works. Um, what was my perception? First of all, my mother was a woman, I, I remember as a child, she never gave up. She had always a, a, a solution, always was looking for a solution, and faced the advertisements as World War II uh, with really significant courage looking back, and she was without a husband. When we moved to, uh, that is the part that interests you, when we moved back to Africa after the debacle of the war, <coughs> we were uh, in basic survival level. My father had come back to Italy and had been very disappointed and went quickly back there and we followed him one year later. Uh, and my mother looked around and... Uh, uh, you mean after the uh, war? Yes, after, ah, the, okay. after the war. Uh, my mother looked around and uh, decided that she, uh, after trying everything, few things that uh, she really didn't like, decided to go back into painting. And within... Uh, she had always been in love with the African landscapes before, before World War II, during her first years in, in Africa before the war. And very quickly... Yeah, we, when did you exactly went to um, Africa? When the family, she, when had the family gone, uh, she had gone to Africa in 1937. We came back at the beginning of World War II. My mother and I, and my father remained there. And then uh, after the war in 1947, 47, I was nine, we went back to, to Eritrea. I see. And uh, by 1951, she started to emerge for the, as a first painter. And uh, um, <coughs> initially, she was working on landscapes in the highlands, and uh, um, they saw them. People were, loved them. And she put into that some uh, particular understanding of that nature that most of the painters around did not. And plus, she was a superb drawer. She knew how to draw very well. So it was very easy for her to put together the uneven complex. Uh, she always uh, painted uh, in vivo. She never painted for photographs or things of the sort. And by and large, she painted landscapes. Uh, rarely she painted human. Especially initially, but that was the beginning, and it was. A, a, I think that it helped her to find a beginning of a healing after the profound wounds, psychological, that she had had to go through. And it was a healing for all of us, for every one of us who lived in Africa. Uh, Africa was incredible. That's why we all suffer of African sickness. <laughs> but still now, I, I, I am really now. I, mean, I cannot see an African movie without feeling... Yeah, good. African sickness uh, is a distinctive experience that uh, it's not just apparently, but it's, it's a fact that because of the, 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 the spectacle of nature is so overwhelming that once you experience that and you go back to home, you go back home, you feel this melancholy, this, this, this feeling of missing something that apparently is, is very hard to, to, to feel. So that is specifically what is African sickness. Yeah. So, and, but you mentioned something before that was very beautiful. You said that uh, the journey of your mother uh, started and, and then uh, throughout her life, it was this um, experiment to find the meaning of art, art itself. Yes. So she started with a figurative um, um, in, in order to basically um, uh, giving a picture of what she was seeing and experiencing. The, the beginning was uh, largely you could see in her paintings what she had carried from Italy, which she carried from her early experiences naturally. And then she began to find her own way to include uh, the African component into the uh, Western style and became more and more free from the Western, although she still uh, um, had great consideration for her masters and so etc. But she became freer and started to develop her own expression in the figurative level. And she was there and she stayed in that, uh, which, you know, probably the last one that you can see is this landscape here, which came in a second phase. But she stayed uh, 
in, in that figurative uh, uh, system of things for quite a few years. I see. Well, then uh, surely from a, like a pure artistic point of view, what is interesting, and uh, this was actually how uh, the conversation started with, uh, with, uh, with Deborah, of course, we are talking about a time that was extremely, extremely intense, especially because in Italy um, uh, there was this um, artistic culture, culture movement that was, uh, that was futurism, that uh, it was really a double-edged sword somehow. It, it was a very revolutionary style, but part of the establishment rejected that. Uh, also because it was politically associated with fascism, so it was very complicated. Italy, we know, didn't have really a good relationship with Africa at that time. But what is interesting, and that's what we pointed out, the extremely positive message that comes from the, 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 the early years of, of Nene, is that uh, it proves that a single life, an individual, can go over history and, uh, and all the major issue, issues in history, and with an individual path can actually build a positive message because despite the war, despite um, Ethiopia and Eritrea being uh, colonies of Italy, despite Italy uh, losing the war, over these years we have a, an artist uh, with the background of um, Italian uh, culture and, and all the techniques uh, who went to Africa and basically became a reporter of what she was seeing, and uh, and uh, and if uh, among the many wrong things that Italy might have done in in, in Africa, it, it's it's beautiful to think that uh, there was this talent that was donated somehow, and that the Africans they appreciated what she was doing. She was she, they actually saw that also. Think about that. They had to overcome a lot because she was an Italian. She was a foreigner and an invader. Instead. That wasn't on the table. What was on the table was her art and her ability to give a picture of what, of what she was seeing. And in, in, in doing this, uh, surely now we can appreciate what is the legacy of, of those years. And in, in, in this I would like to uh, also uh, ask to, um, to uh, Deborah what she uh, likes or what she likes to uh, point out from these early years when she's still in her uh, figurative uh, stage and uh, she brings her experience from Italy to Africa and in Africa she starts uh, uh, to discover a whole new uh, world and, and that's what also might help us to bridge to what is the next period that goes to Impressionism and, and Cubism. But uh, it's interesting to, to, to hear from uh, Deborah um, the thoughts about this first bridge from Italy to, uh, to Africa. I hate to say this, but I think my father would actually understand that better because he was there with her and he was living alongside her. I mean, I'd okay, love to then. talk, but, it's on you again. <laughs> but, I would, but I will say one thing that you talked about. You talked about the beauty that came out of, you know, an Italian being there. I was recently in Eritrea, and when I was there, and when they learned that I was the granddaughter of the artist who did the panels on the um, Endemarian Church, they, the respect that I felt, and the love that I felt, and the appreciation that I felt, I never felt like, ooh, I'm Italian, they probably don't want me there. They, were, they, they remember her, they respect her, they admire her, and they were excited to know that um, her descendants we're still coming back, so I will add that. Yeah, the 50s were basically a progressive adaptation and, uh, and study and improvement of pure figurative arts. The 60s started to, um, she started to assimilate and to include more and more local uh, elements in, in the plus this was the beginning of the big works, the, the public works. Uh, <coughs> panels, uh, mosaics, uh, and the commissions from the Italian Emperor. And with that, uh, she went into another dimension. She continued to paint, uh, uh, and I 
would have some difficulty not being an expert as you are in, in finding the moment when she moved from an initial to a Suzanne and things of the sort. But it was clear in a way of uh, painting even landscapes that there was a, a less and less attention to the detail of the image and more attention given to her uh, interpretation of what she was seeing. And, uh, and things started to be a little bit loose, if you allow me to tell. Yeah, well, so, um, just to remind to ourselves what, uh, what this transition uh, might, might mean, and usually means for an artist, is that when you go to something that is uh, purely figurative, as you can see in the painting here, the second, or the one in the middle, when, it, when it's something, when the style is figurative, it's basically the artist is making a picture on a painting. So, as you can see, it looks like a picture. So you can see the borders, you can see the shapes, you can see the, the colors are uh, within the, the borders. And uh, it's interesting that that's basically what the artists were doing at that time. They, 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 they used to think that that was their job. Their job was to uh, replicate reality on a canvas. And then that's when the you know, impressionism started to kicked in when uh, basically emotions uh, come in, uh, into place. So your job is not anymore just to make a, a, a picture of what you're seeing, is putting your feelings and emotions on that, on that image. So, but for anybody else in Europe, that was happening in, in Europe. So, you know, we have uh, Monet, all the uh, famous uh, paintings with the Impressionism and the Expressionism. But if you start looking, for example, at the one, uh, the, the landscape that Vincenzo pointed out, you, you start seeing that more than a picture, it becomes blurred, it becomes more vague. That's because it's more about the memory that you have of a place. It's not just making a, a, a picture of something. It's filtering that image through your, through your emotions. And what is unique about Nene is that that happened in Africa. She was an Italian artist. She was in Africa, so we don't see these landscapes in basically any other work of European uh, artists at that time. It's unique. It's really like a photo reporter from CNN going <laughs> from one zone to the other, and that she was the only one who did that. that that's why uh, that what make that that's what makes this experience so uh, so unique. So uh, that said about uh, this period. Then, for sure, the African uh, period is more characterized on the fact that Nene decided that a canvas apparently wasn't enough. <laughs> so, in some ways, uh, it, it's something that we saw in, 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 in Picasso. I think one of the uh, most uh, inspiring experiences that somebody can have, uh, because we're used to uh, look at Picasso and it's bi-dimensional. It's on a canvas, but if you actually look at the pot, at the pottery he used to make, the, the sculptures, then you understand that what was going on in his brain was was three dimensional. But unfortunately, a canvas is bi dimensional. So, and uh, that is a way that you can see an artist shaping reality the way the artist sees reality. So that is an important transition for for an artist because. One thing is painting, another thing is making installations or building uh, mosaics, as, as she did. And uh, in, uh, it's, it's basically uh, uh, also a, a process of uh, liberation, I guess. It's like for her it was, okay, I'm going to shape the world the way I, I see it. And, uh, and again, what is unique about Nene is that she did that in, in, in Africa, despite the diplomacy, policy, political issues. Uh, that were in place. They recognized a the talent and they said, okay, we want you to work on these major infrastructure that are still, are still there. So that is another phase of, of Nene's uh, experience that while she was transitioning from uh, figurative to impressionism, and we talk about that, but from impressionism to cubism, cubism is basically what we uh, see in, in, in Picasso, very, very recognizable. But I think it's useful to uh, point out what, uh, like her works uh, that she did in the, in the main in the main hall in the in the, in the school in Africa. I think and the mosaics because uh, even uh, 
it's, it's very handy. It's something that you, <laughs> you need a lot of space, a lot of work, and it's a physical effort also. And let's not forget, she was a regular woman and who had to work in Africa uh, in order to make this happen. So again, if you can please share with us uh, you know, some thoughts of experience about her experience in Africa, working on these uh, uh, installations and, uh, and uh, public commissions, public, yeah. public procurements. Yeah, in a certain way, that was the period where she showed to the strongest, to the strongest point, <laughs> uh, never give up. Um, <clears throat> the mosaics, as a detail, I can talk about one, because uh, it, for a few months, uh, I couldn't walk in the house because there was the mosaic. <laughs> it was, uh, and she did it. Uh, don't go there. You don't want to disappoint an Italian mother, you know, because they have the magic flip flaps, you know. They throw you this flip flap and yeah. can turn corners. I remember she did it on her knees and she went uh, to a physician and said, uh, and my knees hurt, and he said, uh, uh, Mrs. Sanguinetti, you should pray less. She said, praying? <laughs> Uh, this was the mosaic of the, um, for the church that the emperor had uh, commissioned to, uh, for her to paint. It was a church in Anson that was uh, sponsored also by Queen Elizabeth. It was the new church, the major church of Ethiopia, where there was the tabo, where there were the, the Ten uh, Commandments. Uh, there were several Ten Commandments in Ethiopia, but this was the one that had theoretically the real ones. And uh, she did uh, all the paint, all the mosaics uh, in our living room, piece by piece, and put them together in squares. And then, with uh, someone, moved to Absu, which is uh, 1,500 miles away, and, and found that uh, um, she couldn't go in the church because the church was close to everything that was feminine, including chickens. So the um, uh, governor of uh, Aksum told uh, Mrs. Sanguinetti you should uh, uh, dress as a man. <laughs> my wife said, you, I am not. I'm going in there as a woman. And so she waited for a month and a half till the emperor sent a special permission for her to go into the church. And then she put up these famous, uh, these very beautiful mosaics that no one can see because the church is closed to everyone. But that is probably one of the instances where she was determined, she found a way in Asmara to make uh, pieces of mosaic. She started to crack little tassels one by one by hand and uh, she made uh, 40 meters, 60 meters of mosaic with, which were representing wow. the Queen of Sheba going to Jerusalem, meeting with Solomon, coming back, uh, the sword uh, steep. Sorry, taking the art and the covenant and bringing to Ethiopia, all around the tabernacle. Wasn't she also um, escorted by armed guards every time she went there? Big uh, Escorted by armed guards? Initially, yeah, she was escorted by armed guards. When she went in as a woman, although she had the permission by the emperor, the governor gave her armed guards to make sure that no one would shoot her. <laughs> well, a good example that you can be a rebel, a rebel with grace and, and if you are determined enough, uh, bending some some pretty pretty tough uh, rules, and um, and again we have to uh, picture this happening in in, in the 50s, you know, uh, the happy days years uh, here in, uh, in 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 America. So try to picture this <laughs> this woman, if you not know, dealing with emperors and and kings <laughs> and having uh, uh, royal exceptions, imperial exceptions, just just for her. Uh, but this also tells us how powerful art is, you know, uh, the, the, despite everything was, was going on, uh, they wanted her to do that and, and somehow they, they, they found a way to uh, let her uh, do it. And uh, so what was for you, Deborah, when you uh, went there uh, as, a, as her uh, granddaughter and, uh, and, 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 and seeing these, these works of your uh, grandmother, uh, still, still there, and as you said, like uh, some, somehow even uh, revered, still for for that kind of uh, experience that was uh, shared with, with them, the respect they still show them, um, about her. I'm still processing it. It was magical. It was incredible. I grew up hearing about Eritrea, and 
when I was there, I would just look out the window and we would go through these um, mountains and somebody asked me, you know, what are you thinking about? And I said, I'm thinking about three people. I'm thinking about my grandfather as a young man going there. I'm thinking about my father growing up there. And I'm thinking about my grandmother and seeing a landscape and saying, you know, am I looking at something that she would have said, I have to stop the car right now and pull out my easel and start drawing. These are the things, I thought about the three of them. And when I would, the first um, public work that I came face to face with was the Agassian School. And I just started sobbing. I started, I was just sobbing. And I couldn't believe it. And there was her signature in the right hand corner. And uh, the second one I saw was Endomarium. By then, no tears, I, I, I cried all my tears. But I just, it was, I was in awe. I was in awe. For every single thing I saw, I was in awe. And um, I have to go back. It's not just Maldafrica. It's like I feel like she's there. I mean, she's everywhere. But I have to, uh, it was, like I said, I'm still processing it. Well, yeah, it's hard to imagine how overwhelming that, that may, may be of something like a person that was also very close to you and, uh, and having a, basically a piece of her in another part of the world and, uh, and uh, having people having stories about her that you didn't, you well, didn't know guy, about. Well, the guide, I was with a group of architects and engineers, Italians, and the guide knew my grandmother. And he said, oh, look at that street. She would be walking down that street. She always wore white shoes. She was so elegant. She was always in a rush to go to um, the tabaki where she would get the mosaics mm -hmm. and the tiles. And that was incredible. But truly, when, when people learned that I was the granddaughter of the woman who did the Andamarium, they just, I just felt the love and the respect. And that just blows you away. Yeah, it's really, uh, well, it's also, it, it's beautiful and it's a privilege to, to share such a, uh, like a, such a, um, a, a, a dense, important uh, message uh, from, from her. So now, uh, so from a more a, a technical point of view, so we go from a time where we can see the figurative style and then we go to the uh, impressionists and then here on, on the right, especially at the center, we can see the, the, the uh, cubist, basically, uh, uh, stage of of her, her career, but again, this is only uh, temporary because that is part of uh, her uh, evolution, uh, basically, where you see, um, again, you see more defined shapes, but you see that, again, the landscape uh, uh, now becomes uh, subjective. You see shapes and figures, but you can really put it in a, in a, in a, in a defined uh, space. Uh, the space is subjective because space and time become uh, subjective. But again, this is uh, only a stage uh, for Nene because then she uh, completes her uh, transition where uh, abstract uh, comes into place. Not only for her, but for the rest of the world. And uh, something that uh, Vincenzo uh, early on pointed out when we had a briefly conversation was that you can easily picture that, that she went from Cezanne to Kandinsky very recognizable uh, artists and, and, and painters, but really they, it tells you what was this, this bridge for her, where she goes from blurred lines of an emotional experience to complete abstract, where you, uh, where she put angels because she did love angels, right? <laughs> that was an element that uh, was, well, was very recurrent. There's a story behind the angels of La Libera. Mm -hmm. um, then please tell us. <laughs> We want to know more. Yeah. So the Angels of Valibela. Valibela is a site in Ethiopia, and it's a World Heritage site. And there are 14 churches that are built. 12 or 14 churches that are built in the in the rocks and the stone. And I might ask David Koch because he was recently there to talk about it. And the legend is that the men would work on these um, stone churches, and the angels would come at night to help them with their works. And she fell in love with these angels of Lali Vela. Yeah. yeah, that was the story because uh, the, <coughs> the workers who had to dig inside this mountain, the tools were primitive and uh, tend to break up. So God became uh, touched. The king, uh, the king uh, had uh, wanted to have these churches, but uh, 
God became touched because the king's walker would not make him, and he sat down the angels by night. And you can see the angels that are shaping, making shapes and building. That is what is captured. This is measuring space, or things of the sort. And incidentally, I think that this is the beginning of a, a movement into abstract, you know, into moving into, as you say, spaces that contain the figure, but the space becomes an essence. It becomes a, 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 an important factor. Yeah, definitely. So again, uh, what is unique about this experience was that uh, Nene was uh, basically able to uh, process uh, through her own experience and her artistic talent to uh, basically be a mirror of what was going on in the world, basically. And uh, so surely we can see that uh, from, from the uh, uh, Cubist era, and this is already in the, when she came back to Italy. She, 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 she went back to Italy. She said that after she lost the landscapes mm. you know, the, and, and said for a while I didn't know how to express myself. Then I went back and there is a painting at the end that is a broken recollection. She said, I tried to recall pieces of Africa that were significant and to enclose it into geometric forms so they would not escape me anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning wow. of the moons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's unbelievable. It's so natural. Oh, you know, I don't remember well, so I'm going to make amazing paintings, you know. <laughs> Yeah, for somebody who can even like draw a cat or a dog, and it's better that I don't do that because you wouldn't be able to say which one is the dog, Me which too. one is the cat. Okay, it's embarrassing. They look like giraffes for some reason. I have long necks. But, uh, yeah, that was Nene, you know. So yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah. So the so we can see that this is important as a testament. When we just so pointed out, it's it's it, it tells you really that we go over uh, many different experiences in life where when you have this uh, a, a talent, an artistic talent, what many artists have told me is like they, they really don't do art for a specific reason, they, they just feel they have to do it. It's, a, it's an urgency, it's a push that they, they, they can't even explain to, to, to themselves. So in this case it's interesting though that uh, you know there is a, a, I would say a physical grip, like a grip in the physical world, like she was processing this melancholy that, that she had to leave Africa and, uh, and uh, now she, she doesn't, she didn't have her beloved landscapes to, uh, to, to paint on uh, anymore, so uh, she went basically mental, like she started to process mentally uh, what, 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 what was going on and the way, the, the only way she could express that uh, was with um, abstract and, uh, and, and, and and going fully abstract because uh, on if you look uh, if you look back the, the painting that is uh, on your back that is fully abstract so you can clearly see that uh, the difference that goes from this painting here or or the mother with the child it's the same person it's very hard to believe that <laughs> but what's interesting with that back painting is tell the story about what she did before she painted that abstract. Yeah, that painting is entitled uh, History of Human Thought. And uh, I... Of saw, course. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, I, I spoke with her because I was coming, going there twice, uh, twice a year for two weeks and we had discussion. She, once she said, you know, I have this painting in my head. That it, I have this something in my head that I have to express. She was digesting five volumes of an Italian philosopher on history of human thought, an Italian mm -hmm. philosopher that she, she knew. Mm -hmm. And when she completed the reading, she put down the pen. Mm. Yeah, that is very fascinating. I remember that we, we concluded our conversation about, about Nene, uh, talking about that, that painting, because again, one of the first works that uh, Deborah showed me was from the figurative period, and I had to ask, is this work of your grandmother? <laughs> she, she did that, so she went from there to there. It, it's, it's really an, an emotional uh, uh, journey, as you can, as you can see. Yes. I know that you want to close, but a, a, a statement of no, I don't say that the painter, <laughs> painter felt the need to paint. Mm -hmm. I saw another last time in October 2011, she died uh, one week. I, I had to go there for her birthday and she died. Mm -hmm. uh, Passed away 2012. 
And she told me one morning, she said, we have to go to the church down in Finale. You have to take some photo of a crucifix there because uh, um, I'm thinking about uh, uh, making another piece of art, 102. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I knew she couldn't, her hands were better, I said, sure. And she said, but we have to go there around 10.30, 11 in the morning. 